Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Glenn Carlson. You're listening to The Dent Podcast. And in this conversation, we talk with Bernadette Schwert. She's a multiple best-selling author, speaker, trainer, and advisor. She's the founder of four successful businesses, including a machine learning business that allows engineers to be able to identify defects in their critical infrastructure systems, which is totally out of the blue and I didn't realize because her other businesses, she's the founder of the Australian School of Copywriting, which has taught over 10,000 business owners, leaders and executives how to get their message heard and point across in print. She's an ex-actress, she's a TED speaker, she's regularly featured in all of the most credible business media in Australia, and most importantly, perhaps she's part of our entrepreneur faculty at Dent. She helps our clients publish the content they need to attract inbound opportunity at scale. And in this conversation, we get into all sorts of stuff, from cutting out alcohol and using mindfulness techniques to get into zone, to tips and tricks around publishing, and more importantly, how to get out of your own way and effectively brief others to do the heavy lifting for you. And also a whole bunch of tips around speaking, how she prepared for her TED talk, and ultimately just guidance on leading from the front. And so if you're looking for ways, tools, inspiration, and ideas to be able to accelerate your journey as a key person of influence in your industry, allow me to introduce you to Bernadette Schwert. Good morning. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm really well, thank you. Wonderful to see you. You just look you too. awesome. You've just got this vibe. It comes oh, through. You're gorgeous. Thank you. I think, you know, as you get older, I think I've got, I think I'm getting better as I get older. You know, when I look at my youth, I kind of go, wow, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I, you learn, don't you, as you go? And you get more yeah. comfortable with yourself. We're like we're like a good bottle of red wine, Bernadette. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A good Shiraz. What's your <laughs> what's your poison in wine? Um, I haven't had a drink. That's not true. I had a beer the other day, but other than that, I haven't had a drink in about nine months. Um, oh, deliberately? So, well, yeah. I've just I mean I've started meditating twice a day, and I'm just not called to the booze anymore. Um, yeah, right. I, find like I, I used to hit a, 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 like a you know glass of red at night. Yeah, um, definitely. Take the edge off, da da da. Yeah, I just yeah. Don't need it anymore? It's really um, good. It's, it's the awareness, you know, like it's that sort of occasional or casual drinking that you don't even know you're doing it. You know, making your yeah. meal or you know that sense of yeah. connecting relaxation with wine. I, I had to do the same, or else it's like when you have one, you have two. You have two, you know, you're on. That's right, slippery slope. And uh, and what I find found is with meditation like and bringing that attention to the real subtleness of awareness because I, I think I think leadership I think entrepreneurship a big part of it is about being able to tune into your awareness and I think the majority of people are trying to find ways to tune out of their awareness right and, yeah. and so yeah me, I guess meditation was a, an additional tool in being able to I guess, dial into that. And I, I just yeah. found even a glass of alcohol and it, I'm yeah. not as sharp. Yeah. I couldn't tell the difference. Just yeah. doing my day, presenting, talking, business, board meetings, whatever it is, wouldn't tell yeah. the difference. But in that 20 minutes of just bringing it all yeah. back, illness, yeah. it's like, ah, oh, there's a texture that's not. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. So I, this, I don't know, is this good podcast stuff? I'd love to talk about this. I don't know if that's relevant, no, but, but I love all this stuff. The podcast has started. Bernadette Schwartz, welcome to the Dent Podcast. <laughs> you could have given me a heads up. <laughs> well, we just started rolling. <laughs> oh, dear. We're well, just on that. I'm glad I didn't reveal anything particularly too personal about my alcoholism. No, no, not really. Um, but when I, I gave up alcohol when I was pregnant, and then when I started drinking again, and I don't mean drinking, but like having a glass of wine, the day I took it up, I was at dinner and I could feel my eyelids just slowly close. Yeah. It was such a distinct physiological impression that I got from that one glass of wine. I thought, wow. And you're right about the, the texture. Because when you're drinking a lot, you don't notice that slowly the eyelids are kind of just um, yeah. falling, you know. So it was a really interesting. Um, yeah, I think to give it up, you, you kind of feel what it is. And then you can mm. choose to bring it back at whatever level you want. 
I think it's also uh, something that just hit my brain for some reason is when you learn how to sharpen your own knives, you can tell the difference between a sharp knife and a really sharp knife. Yeah. Right? And all of a sudden, what you used to be happy with with a sharp knife is like, mm, I, I like the really sharp knives. Thank you very much. And I, I guess it's yeah. just the same with 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 my mind. And so, but it's also just haven't been called to it. I used to love a drink, you know. And I, I, I even when I was had never been. That's not true. I haven't been fall down drunk in years and years and years. Right. So it was never, never, never that. But um, mm. but yeah, just the just the social, just not interested anymore. Mm. And I'll tell you what, uh, one of our clients, Pete Brennan, launched um oh how have I forgotten the name of it? Oh, heaps normal, the beer. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah, right. Yeah. Beer. Right. And they've just crushed it. Like in, in two years, they've gone to a $10 million valuation. They're in wow. 30, 3,000 outlets around the country. Just brilliant. Well, and, I can uh, attest to that because I started, I call it fake beer. When Again, when I was pregnant 10 years ago or 14 years ago now, I drank this Cooper's Birrell and you can buy it at Woolies for a dollar. Cool. And I'm going, this tastes like beer. It looks like beer and it gives you the celebratory feel of beer, yeah. but it's not. And so I was... I was loving this and everyone's going, what is that drink? You know, like it, it, it looked odd because I could drink it when I was in a non-alcoholic place, uh, like in the car, you know, like in that ad where the guy's drinking and he gets caught by the police and he goes, ah, you know, it's not not real. So anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm all for fake beer. I love it. Love it. Yeah, well, this is in fact, like this is legit. It's it's beautifully crafted. It's uh, like an XPA um, on blind tastings. I can't tell the difference, but they've, they went, they, uh, it was a great, great story it's actually on the podcast with him but um they went to a bunch of pro um uh brewers right but but you know the the kind of um the uh what do you call it the smaller ones the the craft craft brewers yeah micro brewers craft brewers but the really good ones and they just went oh we've been making our xpa can we do a blind test yeah yeah, what do you think what do you reckon the alcohol is in it they're like oh somewhere between four maybe four and a half maybe five at the tops what would we told you what, what would you say if it was non-alcoholic they're like how do i get involved <laughs> and yeah. uh it what was the non-alcoholic pitch. yeah right yeah. and so it and so i got cases of the stuff out the back and um because it is it's weird that when you're at a party or something and everyone's drinking to not be drinking is like everyone's like you're all right yeah so like, it's it, such it, an it, australian it, culture as well and uh, you know, when my mum my and I travel a lot, because my dad died 10 years ago, and we, we travel once a year now, you know, on a big trip. And when we go to places like been in Turkey, China, you know, all through Europe, and we always have wine at night. That's just a little thing that we do. And that no one else is drinking. And I'm not saying other people in countries don't drink, but it's just, it is quite an Australian thing to have you know meal drinks with meals that are alcoholic that other people or maybe would have maybe two or three people would have one you know so that sense of um and she's you know she's 80 something so she's not sort of uh you know in her party days anyway it's just i noticed our culture is quite interesting around drinking and i'm not criticizing that it it is what it is but and i'm part of it but i i have noticed when you travel to um certain countries we have been looked upon like you're drinking again you know, because it might be a 14 day tour and <laughs> we're drinking like, oh yeah, we are, because we like it, you know. Uh, Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Um, yeah. Your best known, like I was just going through your bio, you're, you're obviously best known as a as a speaker, as a presenter, as a trainer, founder of the Australian Copywriting Centre. I think you've taught like, what, 10,000 business owners um, how to how <laughs> to not suck at writing coffee. Um, uh, they're my words, not yours. I like that but, tagline. I might use that. How to not suck. Like yeah. a coffee, good headline. Um, uh, but then I came across your synthetic data business, machine learning and synthetic data. What is synthetic data and what is that about? Because that kind of came out of left field. I'm like, record scratch. What? what? Yeah, like, yeah, supply, yeah. Asset management, supply chain optimization, something or other. Like, what, what's what's that? Yeah. Well, how, how that came about was I, I wrote these two books about online entrepreneurship. And in the second book, I really looked at what makes for a good idea. Like, if you're going to invest a lot of time in something, what, what is that idea going to be? Because as you would well know, if you don't pick the right idea, you can spend a couple of years kind of working it through and realise, hmm, it's not scalable or something. So um, in, in essence, what 
and what I was trying to do was I, I found this idea, you know, and I found this this concept. And what it is in, in machine learning, and and I'll just for those who are listening who maybe don't understand it, it took me a while to get my head around it. It's like a baby, you know, you're trying to teach a baby what an apple is. And so you've got to show the baby a picture of an apple, like a red apple. But there are lots of apples. There's a green apple. So you've got to show them pictures of the green apple. And then apples that are half eaten, rotten apples, you know, all variations of apples, right? And eventually the baby goes, I know what an apple is. Um, and then it doesn't need to be told because it can go, that looks like approximately an apple. That's the concept of machine learning. If you show the computer, like the baby, enough images of something, it will get the drift. And, and the trouble with machine learning currently is there's not enough data to train the baby. You know, if you want to train it to detect like a fault in a power line or something, there's not enough images of that defect to train the computer or the baby. So what we do is we create digital twins of um, the defect and then we, our software manipulates those images to create variations of it and it takes little pictures each time of that variation. So it could be just a, a pixel change, but there's a new image of it. And so we provide that to the client in, in like thousands of those photos of digital twins or digital images that have been um, slightly tweaked. So eventually they can train their own model to spot what that defect might look like because they've now got the data to do so. Yeah, right. And it's purely, so essentially you're creating fake defects to train the baby, right? Spot on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's all visual, right? So you're not it's computer vision. a machine learning how to opt, uh, analyze like, uh, information or um, pulses in electronic frequency or anything coming through the wires to identify a fault. It's all visual faults, like it's a tree. It's all computer vision. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And, then, and then how do they get that vision? They fly drones over their power lines or something, do they? Do... That's, that's how they get the original images and that's how they do all their inspections currently. And what yeah. they want to do is be able to use this kind of, but then someone has to look at each one of those images individually. Like if you look at a, like a power company, they've got probably 2 million images they have to assess every nine months of a power pole, of power poles around the state. Um, that's, that's a lot of manpower to look at each of those images. So what they want to do is use our synthetic data to train a model so that they can feed those images into the system and the, and the computer can look at it and say, based on what we know to be a defect, is this one, you know, this real image, is, is that a defect? So it's about automating and augmenting the... The, the population, you know, the um, the workforce, not eliminating those experts, but helping them do their job more quickly. It's just wild times we're in, huh? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And I was just watching Four Corners the other night and it's all about AI as well and facial recognition and and even Elon Musk, and he said this years ago, and it's quite well documented. He said it's the greatest threat to our civilization mm. is AI. And if, if a guy like that's saying it, and maybe he's got a vested interest, whatever, but... It's pretty interesting to see, you know, there's how many hundreds of thousands uh, closed circuit TV cameras in, in Australia, not to mention China, you know, where that surveillance is, is at a whole new level. Um, and I think why I'm interested in AI is because if you don't have an interest in it, you can be a subject, you can be subject to it and be a victim to it and not even know. So I just like being aware of what's going on and, and having an understanding of every time you do something, it has an impact. You know, every time you click on something, someone's getting that data somewhere and, and look, we all have to do it. But being aware of it, I think it's another level. Yeah, I just, I actually just watched a montage, strange you say, of Elon Musk of the last five years of him talking about how concerned he is with it. And I, lo I, like, I like to know people's agendas as well, right? Because, you know, you see where their biases are, you, you know, et cetera. And I can't find his because, you know, Tesla and everything, these are all AI-driven businesses. Uh, he's definitely at the neat leading edge of it, Neuralink, et cetera. Like for him to be kind of putting his hand up and going, look, we need a, a Manhattan Project-esque initiative to, whoa, like curtail this yeah. or just simply A, the acceleration or, or the consolidation of power into whoever gets there first will be close enough to in infinite for anything less than infinite to be irrelevant. Um, yeah. And, and, and you know, if you look, sorry, you go. I was just going to say, if that gets captured by a bad actor, be it a state or otherwise, et cetera, like he's just like, this is infinitely more potentially destructive if it goes wrong than uh, atomic weapons or nuclear weapons. And it's like, 
This is a guy that has a reasonable track record of of like unpicking complex problems and executing them in the real world. To to make a statement like that so consistently over time from a guy who's so accurately right at a genius level around things that I have no understanding of, it's like... Yeah, you have to take notice. And I think we have history repeating itself. If you look at the power that Google and Facebook and all these tech giants have... It, it didn't come from nowhere. It came because there was lax government regulation and government oversight 20 years ago when the whole thing began. And, yeah. and, and governments are behind on this. And look, I'm certainly no expert in, in governance and all that kind of stuff. But just I think anyone watching can see that we're in this sort of pivot moment where we, if we don't do something to regulate in some way or have some kind of ethical framework about how this mm. is going to unfold, we're going to find ourselves in 10 years' time questioning how did this happen the way we're questioning now how did fake news happen how do we have this situation and i i just think it's history in the making yeah well i mean i was always very uh, a very laissez-faire capitalist i was always very like get the government out of the way um and just let business do what it does and i'm starting to change my tune very slightly when it comes to the gigantic scale of the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks, et cetera, where um, like they're literally like 25 elephants in a room um, that, that, and they seem to have transitioned beyond government's influence. Um, now, the original intent of government is, of course, to serve the people, right? And the problem is once you start to get an organisation big enough, there's enough people with those agendas that we were talking about, like individuals, just on salaries and careers, et cetera. But, you know, they're they're politicking and they're manoeuvring and they're trying to, you know, push their particular agendas forward and achieve what they want to achieve and back-channeling and lobbying and this, that and the other. And all of a sudden, you've kind of got this organization that you know has a legal obligation to profit and it needs to find resources and opportunities to exploit to be able to earn that profit and the concern is when a a a civilization a society a people become part of the resource base that is potentially being exploited then the government, if the government has lost its ability to protect the people because these organisations have got so big, that's a real problem, right? And, and, that's, and that's a real problem when it comes to, well, that now how do we uh, bring in some controls around the proliferation of AI or any of these other things you mentioned, media, et cetera, biases, where are they coming from? What are the agendas? How do we know who's getting shut down for why, et cetera? It's just very, very strange times that we're in. And where I come back to with with Dent and what we do is it's never been the government or big corporate or big business or big media that's really sought to serve the world for good. It's always been the individuals that have created change. Um, And I think it's just more about how more individuals can be more empowered within their sphere of influence to be able to do even more and and kind of expand those edges of influence to be able to change people's minds to be able to affect change at their level based on whatever they're excited about and I guess that's why I was interested in having a conversation with you because I mean the written word um, publishing content is about sharing ideas fundamentally it's about sharing ideas that change the way people think Um, at the level of copywriting you know, it's usually about changing the way people think in order to get them to buy a particular product or service. And there's nothing Mm. wrong with that because sometimes buying those products and services are going to radically improve their lives and solve some problems and give them more, you know, freedom and et cetera. And and I get the sense that a lot of your clients, like a lot of ours, are are good people. They're not selling tobacco or, you know, um, chemicals. They're not cutting down hardwood forests, et cetera. They're, They're, you know, they're just traditional business owners, service providers that are, you know, looking to help their clients, et cetera. But you didn't start as a marketer, communications expert, copywriter, entrepreneur, author, <laughs> TEDx speaker, extraordinary. I'll stop now. But um, you do have a very interesting 
story as it as it kind of leads up to that. And I'm and I'm very interested in I'm very interested in how people overcome adversity, you know, how they overcome the dark night of the soul. And I just I just love your story and I'd love if you could recount it for everybody because you kind of got to early 30s and you were like <laughs> broken. Um and, and so could you paint the picture for us? I think what you're referring to is my my time at drama school. Um, I was I I did a business degree and I worked in advertising and I traveled and worked for Harry and Miller as a you know publicist and sponsorship manager and I was kind of working a sort of very sort of pointy end of you know I guess media and I was very close to these incredible celebrities who were you know defining Australian culture and I always wanted to be an actor I always wanted to be on the stage and I was watching these people that we were managing and I'm thinking I want to be where they are on the other side of the camera right so I always had this passion for acting and I was always acting as a kid and in, in amateur theatre. So I kind of got this business sort of stuff out of the way in some respects. I wanted to sort of tick that box to see what that was like. And then I thought, right, I'm late 30s. If I And having worked at Harry and Miller's and seeing all these amazing theatrical people, I thought, if I don't try this, I will regret this forever, you know, not giving this a go. So I applied for all the drama schools around the country and I got into the Victorian College of the Arts. And so I moved from Sydney where I was living at the time to come down and and gave up, you know, careers and what have you and, and study for three years. And, and I gave it my all, you know, and I was so thrilled to be there because it was quite a privileged kind of, you know, position to get into because I don't take many people. And it was always what I wanted. And so I worked really, really hard. And basically, long story short, I failed, you know, and I had this um, sort of authority figure at the, at, the, at the college who I felt was kind of against me. And every time I tried to do something, I would always be sort of shut down. And I basically failed by one point. And I, I did the year again and, you know, uh, humiliating, I've got to say, you know, because it's quite a small community. So I'm sort of seeing my lot go above and I'm still, you know, in the second year. And to, no joking, I failed again <laughs> and by the same person. And I'm talking like a year of not just nine to six, you know, working, but nine to ten every day, rehearsals, weekends, and it's a very intense environment. So after that, I thought, wow, you know, I'm, I'm obviously, this is not, not going to work. But it really cut me down because it was something I desperately wanted and gave up so much to, to try. And at that point, I had to really look at myself and think, because I still wanted to do it. I still loved it. But I had this amazing sort of authority figure and institution going, you're useless. You, you are not good enough. Um, and so I had to make the decision. I thought, who... Who is going to define what I can and can't do? Am I going to listen to this person? And she was a very strong figure in the, in the community, in the theatrical community. Am I going to let her define what I'm capable of over the next whatever lifetime I live? Or will I listen to her and let that critical voice shut me down and stop me from doing what I really want to do? So it was one of those moments I thought I, I have to define it for myself. You know, So I went on and found my own agent because at drama school, you get given all that stuff. You get a showcase. You get you know, opportunities to, to demonstrate. And you get the pathway, the golden pathway. It doesn't mean it always happens, but you get opportunities. And I had none of that. In fact, I had reversed because now I'm, I haven't graduated. You know, I haven't finished. It's like tainted goods in some respects. So no agent's going to pick you up. Anyway, so I had to find my own way. And I, and I did. You know, I went out there and I got work. And it was, I didn't really manage my mindset about, turning up on set and thinking, do I deserve to be here? Am I a failure? Um, so looking forward, you know, when now where I stand and, and I did I did have, a, you know, some success in acting. It wasn't like Kate Blanchett by any stretch. But I figured what that gave me, those opportunities to work on, you know, Neighbours and Winners and Losers and Jack Irish and the games and work with amazing people and be really up close to exceptional actors was one, I, I probably wasn't good enough. That's the truth. And two, I gave it my best shot. And then acknowledging, I'm looking at other actors going, I don't think I can do what they do. So, and not, that's not to say I gave up because of that, but I just got to a point where I just, every time I got an audition, it was a bit awkward because I'm going, oh, I've got a baby, I've got to travel on the other side of town, I've got to put the makeup on. And I thought that's not the attitude you need, you know, to, 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 go, to go forward. So I, I sort of stopped. And then, but what happened was the speaking took over. You know, I started to go on stage and, and do my keynotes. And for me, that was like theatre. I got the sense of the audience and the sense of 
the the excitement and the adrenaline of theater and I got to write my own script and direct myself and and I probably got paid not probably but I did get paid a, a lot more than what I was doing for acting and not that I ever did it for that reason and now I look back and I think all that was wonderful foundation for what I'm doing now and we talked about it right at the beginning of this podcast about meditation you know we were learning meditation back then and it really wasn't the thing to do I didn't even know it was meditation but it was about breathing and bringing yourself into a state so you can go on stage and not be distracted by something that's happening or the mindsets, you know, taking you out of where you need to be. And I use that daily now to manage my mindset. So, and it taught me to breathe. And when I say that to my friends, I go, breathe, surely you know how to breathe. It's like, no, it really taught me how to be conscious of my breath and deep diaphragmatic breathing to change your physiology. So yeah, it was a, a harrowing time and I've never forgotten it. And but I don't regret it. You teach mindfulness. Is that right? Mm. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I um, didn't plan to be a teacher of it, but my brother was in the AFL industry as a, as a perform- high-performance fitness coach with the Crows, Adelaide Crows, and he was asked by someone at Carlton, did he know anyone who could teach mindfulness to the players because they were looking for a mindfulness coach. My brother mentioned me. So I met with the Carlton AFL coaches and they said, let's start. And so I, I set up the foundation program for the Carlton Mindfulness Program. And I don't take responsibility for their performance right now. <laughs> but they were beautiful young men and they were so willing to learn. And I loved teaching it. I love setting up, you know, this um, opportunity for them to experience this because I, I do believe it's the one percenters with, with um, sport now. And you can see it with all the Olympics, but... If you've got someone standing in front of goals and they're 10 metres out, they've kicked that a million times at practice. So why is it that in a game and they're 10 metres out and they kick it off the side of the boot, you know, what is happening in that moment? Because physically they know how to do it. But something happens to the mind, which is they hear the coach's voice, they hear the audience's voice, they hear their own voice, and it, it derails them. So what I was trying to do in that program was get them to just be in the moment of that, of that, just kicking the ball and that relaxation and trying to stop those voices from impinging on their mindset in that moment. And, and that's kind of what I was teaching. When you say being in the moment, um, what percentage of people listening to this, right? So business owners, entrepreneurs, would you imagine have actually experienced a, a real experience of, of conscious presence, like truly being in the moment. Because in, in my experience, there is a very distinct shift of consciousness from like you're dreaming. That's one state of consciousness to being kind of um, uh, totally unconscious asleep. Then there's being awake as we are. But, there, but when we're awake, we tend to be thinking. And then there's this other state, which is awake and not thinking. Mm. where it's truly a like presence. And there's like, I think Deepak Chopra calls it like the gap where you, you drop in. Um, what percentage of people do you think experience that on a regular basis? I don't know. But what I do know is that there's more awareness about wanting to be in that moment. And so I, I honestly can't give a figure, but I love the fact that you talk to people and you, and you realise that they meditate now, like CEOs and leaders. And, and I, I just think it's, it's a fantastic development because I think when you don't have that awareness of that moment where you have a choice, and that's for me what mindfulness is, it gives you, it buys you a couple of seconds, microseconds to go, what is my response going to be in this moment? And when you have that lower level of our, our base level reacting, it's through anger, it's, you know, it's lashing out because that's what you've been flared, you've been triggered. And that's the natural reaction is to defend and to protect. But through that mindfulness, you can just have a moment to go, okay, I have a choice here. What is the, the, the better case? You know, what is the outcome I want here? So you can choose to say, oh, well, I'm going to give a question now rather than just react. I'm actually going to ask a question and get a bit more information or um, come out with mindfulness and heart, you know, rather than defending. So I, I think it's a good thing. And the more that we can bring mindfulness into the workplace and teach people about having that moment to consider their reaction, I think it makes for a nicer workplace. I've, I've also found it leads people 
to their purpose. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, when we ask, when I ask business owners, like, to, like how many of you feel like you really dialed into your purpose or another way I might frame it is how many of you sometimes feel frustrated that you're not quite sure if you're on purpose or not, et cetera. And it's easy 70, 80%, like the vast majority are, are doing the do, but are not necessarily feeling really dialed in. And there are so many different courses and workshops and seminars and gurus and all sorts of stuff. You can go to the kind of like find your purpose and find your why and all this sort of stuff. In my experience, dro dropping into that stillness, it's almost like, I mean, if, if, we were to, if we were to think of it from the perspective of we are not separate to nature, we are a, a part of and included in the, the circle of life, just watch The Lion King with my daughter for the hundredth time, I think, um, you know, the, the circle of life, we're a part of that and nature doesn't struggle to grow, right? Na nature knows how to bring this dynamic, infinite, infinite complexity together in, in the most magnificent um resource friendly optimized ways right and a tree doesn't a tree doesn't struggle to grow my experience at least and, and i've on good authority heard it from many many people that have a similar experience is by dropping into that state of presence regularly it allows us as beings of nature to receive impulses calling it's almost like oh i'm interested in that like but where is that interest coming from? And, and often when we are unconscious, going through life this is my experience, at least like Netflix and just being busy, just being busy at work, we're kind of forcing our will and almost overlaying it from a some subconscious or conscious human mind level, which isn't necessarily very optimized or very effective. You know, we set all these goals, we get our goals and we're still not happy type of a deal. I've found that ever since... I've been seeking charm that seems to manifest itself from that gap. Like what's charming after a, a meditation? What's calling me from that stillness? It has just led to a much deeper, richer, more prosperous where life where it's almost like everything happens much easier. It's kind of like that football kick, you know, I've done it a thousand times. A tree doesn't struggle to grow just, tap it in sort of thing yeah yeah um well it's a bit like when uh, buddha said oh sorry gandhi he said um yeah i've got a really busy day today and his assistant said well will you be cancelling your meditation he goes no i'm going to double it and i think it's that counterintuitiveness if we're super busy and distracted and i know this is for me when i've got a lot on and you know and your mind's not in a good space you go i just need to step back a second even though it's counterintuitive because you think i've got to do more it's like sit be with be present and then a lovely little phrase i heard was rather than meditate it seems like an amorphous concept is just listen you know actually just mm -hmm. listen to what's going on internally um mm -hmm. and be conscious of listening you know whatever those those things might be for you so i, I just love those little hints you know and um yeah, I think even just 10, like for me driving, I, not that we're driving too much these days, but when I'm at the traffic lights, and this is what I said to the Carlton guys, I said, in micro moments of meditation where you can, you know, you can't necessarily set aside an hour of a day, but you're at the lights, it's red, rather than going, Ugh, annoying, you know, being held up, just relax the grip on the steering wheel, just ease into that little moment of enforced relaxation and treat it like a, a micro meditation so now when i'm at the red lights my instinct is not to react to it it's like ah oh, a moment you know, even if i'm and that's why i try not to run late to things because that's another way you set yourself up to be stressed is you just don't allow enough time for those beautiful moments of of relaxation in the shopping queue you know at the supermarket so instead of when there's a line i go brilliant an opportunity to to be mindful i find um uh, transitions are good for that as well. So I've started every time I sit in the car, I'll take five breaths before I start the car. Um, before I come in to the house, I'll just take a moment to uh, the, the phrase come to one's senses, right? It's just, I just, I feel my body. I, I try and observe any smells. I try and hear what I can hear. And I just come back to the senses because the senses bypass the thinking mind and they go, they, they are, uh, designed to only receive data and information from the now from the, the moment right you can't get caught in the past or the future with 
when you when you come to your senses or mm. when I leave here and go out to my family just a moment before I open that door just a breath just a yeah. to come to one's senses and it's this recalibration because I, I find um humans especially entrepreneurs business we're not good at tasks shifting the, the more we shift tasks or switch tasks the more stressed we get if we don't create a smooth transition between the two which is like why a lot of um uh, you know efficiency how to run your calendar effectively is like batch do do all of your business development on this day and all of your admin on this day and all of your strategy on this day as opposed to kind of you know schizophrenically yeah. jumping from one to the next because that forcing your brain to task switch open up a new app totally. and that, 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 that just burns i think there was a i don't know the study but it was something about 30 percent more energy is burnt through ineffective uh through unnecessary and ineffective task switching so by simply, well, I, I read it was 23 minutes it takes if you switch out of one event into another it takes yeah. 23 minutes to get back into the zone and and i'm super conscious of this because i write a lot and, and and we all do you know we're all into an intense moment of writing something and i know the temptation you see an email come through or a text and the temptation is just to quickly check and now i've had to be so disciplined because i just go if i do that it it might be a second but i've got to now switch it just takes me to that moment of that you know the phone so i have to be incredibly disciplined to not be sucked into that which is i just don't check anything now if pick in the mornings you know writing is a good time for me in the morning and but the first thing to do is you think check your email what's coming overnight it's like no i'm not going to do that and it takes monumental discipline to not yeah. check your email in the morning well I, I heard that um basically your email is a list of other people's priorities for you <laughs> yeah i like that Right. That's so true. Um, and uh, and anything on social, I don't have any of the social media apps. Uh, that's not true, but I have them on the third. Uh, I have them all on silent. The third I have screen. Them on the third yeah. screen. Right. So yeah. it's, uh, and uh, you have to work to get it. Yeah. I found that to be helpful. And I've just over time, over, over a period of years, just totally detached myself from the, the, you know, the, 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 the rat in a maze with the sugar cube kind of being teased at the, at the end um but you talk about writing and you talk about writing in the morning and of course you you your um would you say writing is your superpower um oh that's i guess it's a i don't know what i have as a superpower um i i've spent a lot of time doing it and i think if you look at the malcolm gladwell you know ten thousand hour kind of expert thing i've definitely put my ten thousand hours in and I do know that as the years have gone on and I've written books and, you know, the books are like 80,000 words there and that's probably 80,000 extra on top of that gets deleted. And when you write that much and you delete that much, you get a disassociation from your content. You go, you know what? I just ditched 10,000. Big deal. You know, mm. you don't get attached to it and you don't go, that was a waste of time. I think, well, I just became a better writer because I wrote 10,000 extra words and I became more discerning about the words that I chose as well. So, um, I love the fact that the, the power of words can help people change their lives. And I know that sounds really corny, but I know with the students that I work with and I have trained lots of people. And even just yesterday, there was a, a guy that came into my, my world. I trained him back in 2005 and he now he, he's the head of this global SEO agency and they've won all these awards and I'm gonna put him on a podcast very shortly, but it's like, wow, I remember you. You know, you were like a 23 year old, kind of a nerdy, kind of awkward young man and now here you are leading this incredible agency and he he comes back and says it's because of the course that I did with you like a short course and that's what I do think short courses can have a big impact or you know long courses like Dent have a massive impact and and that is to be valued and I love the fact that the, what I do does change people's lives and and it gives them the confidence to pursue something that they really enjoy and want to do so that if that's a superpower maybe when did you is there a time in your past where you started writing from not like have you always like some people have always journaled or what have you and it's just evolved or or was it something that really wasn't part of your world and then it began through a conscious decision of some sort i've always journaled first i've got boxes of yellow 
paper, you know, just stories and ideas and, and just my, my daily life. And then I hooked into Julie Cameron, you know, the artist way, which is a beautiful sort of journaling technique, which is just get your morning thoughts out, get rid of the rubbish, and then you can start to, to write. So I, looking back, I've always written, not professionally, I never destined for those things to be published. But then one of the first documents that made a massive impact on my career was I was working in advertising, as I mentioned, and and I saw this job ad in the newspaper, right, Sydney Morning Herald, tiny when job ads were in the paper, and it was this Harry and Miller role, and it was the job of the lifetime, right, and I went for it, and I wrote a little proposal uh, about Gough Whitlam, which was one of his clients at the time, who sadly passed, but, you know, um, I wrote how I would market Gough Whitlam. So I wrote this comprehensive proposal on how I would promote golf and then I got the job and when I asked Harry why I got it said because of that proposal you went the extra mile so for me those opportunities to use words to add value and to provide someone with an extra um, you know benefit really made a big difference and, and then in advertising obviously it's all about the writing even though I wasn't a copywriter in the advertising world I was an account director so you're more the management strategy side um, I always looked at the creatives going, oh, I wish I could do what they're doing, you know, but they seemed so remote and it was like, oh, the vaunted, you know, worlds of the creatives. And then I had to make the mental shift. I'm going to step into that world, you know, because um, I wanted to be that. And then a friend of mine, and I've told this story to my students a lot, but I was had this very sort of strong mental block about I'm not a copywriter. I'm not a writer. I don't have the authority to call myself a writer or a copywriter in particular. And I talked to this friend of mine called John, who was this advertising agency owner, and he did everything. It was like a small boutique. And he wrote and he directed and he, you know, managed. I said, how do you, you know, do both? He says, well, I just decided to. And he said, what do you need to become a writer? Who's going to anoint you a writer? Um, and he said, I anoint you a writer today. And it was kind of like, I'm a writer. So you have to give yourself permission. And I think with everything, um, you have to give yourself permission because no one's out there going, you are now an actor. You are now an entrepreneur. You are now whatever. You just have to take it on and do it. And that's it what, is interesting that's when you become it. It is interesting though, because that's really not what we're taught at school. We're taught like, oh, you do an apprenticeship and now, you know, you're a, a sparky or you do a course and now you're an engineer or now you're a doctor or now you're a lawyer. It's almost like in the, what, what used to be seen generationally as um, very much the most prestigious professions in the world. You very much were anointed by someone else. There's very much that hierarchy. And yet the, the world of entrepreneurship, which I think absolutely spills through the entire corporate world, um, now because you know the, the idea of a career in one firm you know obviously hasn't held water for a couple of decades um there is no gatekeeper and yet often i guess through a bit of the, the cultural hypnosis that we have or, or just you know habits if you like um conditioning if you like we we often tend to default to needing to have that anointment if you like to be able mm. to say go go forth and and mm. do do you have a do you have a routine do you have a, a set of rituals that you kind of do to set up a a zone of writing not really I'm not good with routine I, I must admit that I've had the same breakfast for about three years so <laughs> I don't know if that's a routine um but no I I tell you what, I sit in my chair, which is this chair I'm sitting in. And once I sit in the chair, I'm in, you know, but getting to the chair can be a challenge. But the minute I'm in the chair, I'm good. And so I break down and I, I work from home and I've got 13 steps up my staircase to my office. And I think if I could just get those 13 steps, I'm good, you know, and I might use music to get me there, you know, but I, I do know that if I get to the chair, I'm good, but getting there is a challenge sometimes. So for, I mean, the majority of people listening to this is going to be a, a small business owner. Of course, you're um, our publish mentor for the, the KPI program. Um, and thank you for that, by the way. You're awesome. <laughs> I love it. I love Everyone it. loves you. Um, but what do you say to a small business owner, an entrepreneur that's up to their eyeballs in other stuff, right? And they know they need to have what we would call an ecosystem of influence. They know they need to have content out there. They know 
if someone's going to be making a big decision, they're going to Google, they want to educate themselves, they want to go down a bit of a rabbit hole. They know that all needs to happen, um, or at least they do <laughs> after we've got hold of them. Um, but often the the writing of it, the doing of it is, is a chasm to cross. And, and it seems usually from what, what I've found more of a psychological one than a, a time one. It's usually around, I don't know what I'm doing. It doesn't come out well. It's just a mess, et cetera. Like get me talking and I'm fine, but get me in front of the keyboard and it all, it all goes to shit. Um, in, a, in a world where content is so important to develop an edge in business, but writing that content seems to be a rare talent. How do you circle that square for people? I think it becomes overwhelming for people because they've got so many ideas and they don't know how to manage those ideas. And so what I say is pick one, you know, I call it the container. Get one idea, one headline, one blog, and then you nominate your word count, let's say 500 words. And then you look at what problem you're solving. So, and I put a how-to formula in front of that, how to overcome overwhelm on the footy field, let's just say, whatever the problem is. And then your bottom line is your call to action. What are you doing next? What do you want this person to do? Click on here or book in or whatever. So once you've got your edges, as I call it, then you can sort of work out, oh, you've got 500 words. And, and then I go through my process. But I think it's just saying pick one blog to write, you know, not 50, not 10, not three a week, one. So once you've just, if you're going to do it yourself, that's kind of a way to do it. I think secondly is to acknowledge you don't have to do it all yourself. If you think about your tax, you think about your haircut, you think about, you know, um, your IT, your cleaning, you, you hire a professional to help you. You know, you don't know how to do it. So you, you get someone in. And I think the same should be applied to copywriting as well, that you can get your tax together in a little white shoebox, but then give it to the accountant. And the same with copy, get your ideas just down, give it to a copywriter and help let them do it for you. You can't expect to know how to write copy if you've never trained. It, it's, I think people with expectation they should be able to write, I think needs to be addressed because they hold themselves accountable and give themselves a hard time. It's like, it's a skill. It's a learned skill. And if you don't learn it, you can't be expected to do it. So I think you've got to give yourself a bit of a break and let someone else help you. I often get a lot of feedback that people try and work with copywriters and what they get back is, well, they're not happy with. Um, I've got my own opinions as to uh, the, the, the potential upstream causes of that. But I, I mean, you are obviously the, the copywriting queen, not only do you teach people how to do it, but then I go on to become professionals, etc. You probably know more about copywriting in Australia than, than the most have ever learned and forgotten. Um, what, why would you say people have bad experiences with copywriters? Yeah, I think people have bad experiences with all sorts of creative professionals. And I would include architects in that. I would include um, graphic designers, photographers, uh, hairstylists. It's about the brief, you know, garbage in, garbage out. It's simple. If you don't give your professional creative person a good brief, it's very difficult to give them something back. And everyone has to play a role here. You know, the copywriter has to be a little bit demanding in getting that brief. And a client doesn't often know what to give. They don't know how to be. They don't know what's needed. Uh, they don't know what's expected of them. So I say to a lot of my students, you, you, it's an education process. You've got to educate your client about what you need and why you need it and that it takes time. And I can remember the only time the project's gone really off the rails for me, and this is 15 years ago, and it wasn't a big copywriting project, but I remember it, is because the client said to me 45 minutes into the briefing, oh, I've got to go now and that should be enough, right? And my instinct was to say, no, it's not enough. I need more of your time. But I let him go. Wrote, didn't do a good job. He didn't like it. And it went badly from there. And it's probably the only project I can remember going poorly. And I take responsibility for that because I didn't set up the meeting properly. I should have said, we need an hour and a half. Your time. If you can't do that, don't do it. And um, Because he needed to leave. So it can start small like that. You just don't set enough time up with the client. You don't 
position the meeting properly about you're the boss as the copywriter. Like I say to them, you need to take control of the meeting because what clients can do is they just go blah and it becomes a sort of avalanche of their story. It's like that's not actually helpful for the copywriter. And so the copywriter needs to control that about saying this is what we need from this meeting, this is what I'm going to do, and this is how I need you to be. And then everyone loves it because then the client can relax and sit back and just do what they are told. And I know clients love that because I'm when I'm talking to a lawyer, uh, you know, an architect, not that I've hired an architect, but, you know, a photographer or whoever, an accountant, if they make me feel comfortable and they say, sit back, relax, you don't need to do anything, I will ask you everything and I will take control. I'm like, I love that, you know. So that's what I think yeah. needs to happen in these roles. I, uh, I remember in my earlier days of business, I'd go unicorn hunting because because really with the overwhelm that was going on with everything I'm trying to learn and understand and put together and like there's risk and what if I fail and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, you want to find someone that can just make magic happen for you. And it's like, oh, copywriter, oh, they're going to make this landing page and like ever, it's going to have a super high conversion and it's going to be fantastic. I'm going to make all this money. And it's like, I just need a landing page and kind of here's what we do and da 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 off you go, write copy. And again, you would just, I'd get just off point, like just atrocious stuff back. Um, because again, I was, I was probably not paying someone enough for them to have high enough standards to push back on me. You know, typically the people that are going to have the highest standards that, that cascades into their, what they charge, et cetera. Mm. Um, but, and that's when I just started really realizing exactly what you said, briefing, briefing, briefing. Um, and, and also, and this is what we, uh, you know, really strongly encourage our clients to get to is to be really freaking clear on the core essence of, you know, the pain your customers are experiencing or, or the payoffs or the prize or the goals or the outcomes that they're trying to get done. And, you know, the, the core stages in which you take them through and the key ideas and the mistakes that they make that keep them stuck and kind of this, this tapestry of ideas that you are bulletproof clear on. You might not know, know how to articulate it in a headline or, or turn it into an article, but you are bulletproof clear on what those problems are and what they get as a result of working for you and being able to create that that kind of tension between the two etc on your own because i think without that i mean the copywriter is just going to come back with fairly uh, fairly vacuous superficial copy right and, and you see it you see it every day people posting this copy that is just um, a veneer there's no traction there's no oomph behind it it's not taking people on a journey it's not captivating or it's hyper spammy um mm. how do you find that balance what's in your toolkit for kind of not being um tepid as a but but then not being overtly spammy you know 1998 internet yeah. marketer yeah thing. yeah jay abraham's kind of thing um it's a spectrum. And I think what KPI do so well in the, the, the problems, you know, the hundred problems, um, problems that you solve, all that work you do or you encourage your clients to do is gold because it's that thinking that doesn't get done. And, and that causes problems. It's exactly what you said. It becomes a very thin film of a piece of copy and it's, it's um, abstract and it's, it's fluffy. Uh, it has no strong benefits, it's, it's got no specificity, and there's no truth in it. And the good copy is when you get to the heart of it, which is what your, your, your worksheets do. And then people can go, they see themselves on the page, they're going, that's my problem. But because it's so specific, and it's so real, it's like a, a mini yes in the salesmanship sort of journey. And if you get enough yeses along the way with the copy, by the time you get to the call to the action or call to action, the person's going, yeah, it's not even a big yes. It's a small yes because it's been 15 yeses all the way. So the spectrum of spammy versus elegant, you know, I guess you look at Chanel, you know, Gucci, and really low copy. If you look at that high branding stuff, they don't use a lot of copy in their advertising to start with. Um, and even on their websites, you know, it's very sparse. It's very concise. And then you've got over here, you know, your internet sales letter. So I think it's about tone and I think it's about your customer audience, about your target audience and working out, well, who are they and what do they need? And at different stages of the buying process, 
they need different types of copy and different levels of um, density. So if you think about the beginning of awareness, you know, they might not need a lot, but they just need to highlight an issue that they're having a problem. But by the time they want to maybe buy something, let's say it's a, a car, then they're going to do a bunch of research and comparison. So at that point, they do want a lot of data. And it's also the problem you're solving. And, and I say, if you've got a child who's got an anaphylactic issue, right, and you see a, an ebook on 50 ways to help your child avoid an anaphylactic reaction, you're going to read every 50, one of, 50 of those points, right? Yep. Because it's super important to you. So it's really? about the... The, set, the severity of the problem and also where they are on the journey. Like if they don't know their child's got an anaphylactic thing, they're not going to read that. So it's all about where are they at and looking at your customer yeah. audience. And you mentioned Chanel. Do you differentiate between copy? Well, I'm sure you do. How do you differentiate? How would someone differentiate between the difference between uh, copy for brand or branding, if you like, versus copy for sort of more of a direct response. Um, because I think the, the Chanel's can um, get away with that branding because they've got global distribution and all yeah. of these things, right? Whereas, you know, a small business doesn't have the luxury of the breadth of yeah. message and the breadth of distribution. Um, and so we kind of need to be, giving people a much clearer next step, whereas Chanel would lose its positioning if it was like 25% off. Come on. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, exactly. Yeah. We, you're yeah. absolutely right. The small business. Sorry. No, just how do you, how do you differentiate between the two? What's your thinking on that? Yeah, I, you're, you're right. You, you don't have the luxury of the big brands. They don't have to do much. They just have to keep showing up, you know, put an ad on. Um, small business have to be a lot, smarter and they have to produce a lot more content and maybe it's just in smaller batches in fact one of the techniques I teach is called uh, link phrases and they're basically words like um, it's no secret that you know in addition to and also um, the truth is you know 30 days from now and there's all these phrases that you can use and and I one of my exercises with my students is to put a piece of direct response copy together and use 10 of these link phrases um, and, and everything else that I teach them. And at the end of the course, they do this beautiful piece of copy and it's professional level, right? And, and it's and they've only been learning for five weeks, but what makes it are these link phrases, right? But what I say to them is the link phrases are in direct proportion to the spamminess of something. Like you've got a lot of these link phrases, it can look really spammy, but if you use a few well-placed, it looks elegant and it just connects all these lovely ideas together. So it's about the ratio of certain phrases that you use that can help things become very spammy. And you might want it to be spammy, right? If you need things to be, you know, acted upon quickly, then yeah. not that people go, oh, I want this to be spammy, but you need a sense of engagement. So it's it's a spectrum. How 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 quickly do you want the audience to react? Yeah, I, I like to sometimes approach my copywriting from the perspective of how how do I say it if I have no morals or ethics whatsoever, if I'm willing to lie, exaggerate, deceive, um, you know, like some politicians that we could probably think of, and I write it from that perspective, and it is totally spammy, fake, hyperbolic bullshit, and then I just tone it back to the point where it's all true. That's and a that fantastic point, you, method. You end up being on this line of being quite compelling, but yet everything is true. I, I found it really interesting what you said before um, when, when you mentioned uh, that when I referred to the veneer or, or the superficial and you said it has no truth to it or something along those lines. And that kind of really landed because I find when people come into like KPI and, and Dent, there's an element of them looking for the marketing hook or the marketing veneer and they're often missing. It's like, just tell them the truth. Like, and if the truth isn't good enough, build a better product so you can just tell them the truth. And that's compelling because what's compelling for people is like you said, like if you have the ability to fix a child's anaphylactic reactions right? Like you don't need hyperbolic messaging. You need clear messaging. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah. develop your product or service or offering to the point where you don't need to be full of shit. And then 
clearly communicate that. <laughs> yeah. And your copy, by the way, Glenn, and I'm not in your pocket, it's fantastic. You know, you, you, I don't know if you're in, you do it all yourself, but it's fantastic. It really, the tone, and I think tone's important as well. People forget the tone. It's spot on, you know. It's really absolutely the essence of what uh, KPI is. So hats off well, to I, you. I used, thank you, I used to, and, and I know, um, and, and here's why. I, coming up um, in my sort of early 20s, uh, we were running an event marketing business and I was MC at a lot of our events, um, introducing speakers, et cetera. And I was petrified. I was terrible. My, I remember my, I remember the first time I went on stage um, uh, to introduce a particular speaker, it was like I had cotton wool in my mouth and peanut butter and had just smoked a joint. And I'm up there. That's about a <laughs> uh, Yeah. Yeah. Literally all of my team, Dan Priestley, up the back behind the AV desks, you know, in the days of AV desks, <laughs> um, if you're at some point, hopefully in the future, uh, listening to this where COVID is not creating kind of lockdowns all around the country, that, that's, uh, that's great. Um, they are peeling themselves in laughter, right? Just in hysterics because I'm making no sense. And the audience is kind of like... Mm. And I'm this young, pale-faced, 21-year-old kid, right, that didn't know any better. So after that, I'm like, oh, I started listening to Tony Robbins and, you know, all these kind of people at the time. And I started taking on their personas, right? And I would, I would because Robbins is like model excellence. It's like, fuck yeah. modeling. I'm just going to copy you. Um, uh, and I did. And, like, to a large degree, that worked. Um, but then I was called out on it, in fact, in front of a, a big, large group of people by a friend who was a speaker, but it was mortifying for me in front of 200 people in this audience, got me up and did this intervention, like, Glenn, where is your voice? You know, you're a cross between, you know, Tony Robbins and John Martini and this person and that person, and these other people who I kind of amalgamated into this veneer of myself. And he slammed me and I was ruined for days i had people coming up to me going that was heavy are you okay and i'm like oh, right. I, am, I am okay but he just spoke spoke some truth it's rattled me and i was rattled because you know it yeah. was, I was, doing best, yeah. I was doing the best with what i'd got i was trying yeah. to like everything that i needed to make happen in the business and this and that i was like crack and um it caused a reformation where i, I it was just a realization, not consciously, like I didn't think this to myself because I'm not that clever, but it was just this realization of I can't be anybody else. So I just have to be me and I just have to suffer the consequences of that, good yeah. or bad. Yeah. And so one of the greatest compliments that I then got, uh, and, I, and I've kind of been been like this for a while now, but this was maybe I don't know, 10, or, 10 or 12 years ago, is um, one of our clients came up to me and said, it was a client that also became a friend that came up to me and said, wow, like you're actually the same person presenting in front of 500 people, which I would often do. than you are at like my dinner party that we had the other night together. Yeah, like right. I'm, I just nice. became the same. I don't change. I don't yeah. have to get into character. I'm just me. I'm just Glenn. Yeah. Um, and it's the same with copy. I'm like, I'm, I'm writing and I have, I have Tracy Angwin in my head, who is one of our first clients who became very successful as a result, just applied our stuff. And she's kind of this, this cool, no bullshit, successful woman that I'd be writing a headline and I can imagine her scoffing, going, what a load of shit. Yeah, <laughs> like, fantastic. You know, and yeah. so I'm kind of, what do I, what would I need to say to Tracy? Yeah. In the day to get, to, to, to earn and keep her attention. Um, yeah. And I kind of, and I, and I would write something from, from that perspective and it's still just me, but it's me talking to Tracy who doesn't have a lot of time and yeah. doesn't tolerate fools. Right. So I was like, yeah. right. Boom. And, and that's it really. And that's time. That's, that's, that's exactly what I talk about is just, there's a person opposite you having a chat. And when you write for this, yeah. the hundreds and, of people, you know, it's boring. Yeah. And I'll say, I'm very good at understanding our customers' problems and what they're trying to get done and, and, and knowing that I need to talk to those explicitly. 
mm. to build relevance, right? If I'm not talking about the problem someone ex is experiencing, I'm wasting their time because I'm here to solve their problem. So I need to get to the point. It's like going into mm. a doctor with a flu or a broken bone and then dancing yeah. around the issue. It's like, yeah, like to it sort of thing. So well, I find they, um, that also helps. The webinar you, you ran recently about scorecards to me was gold standard copy from the email right through to the delivery of the webinar and the support yeah. you provide people with the scorecard. If people haven't already listened to it, they should, because just even from a copywriting perspective, it's fantastic. And it's not... Also, it's, you, you, I'm sorry, carry on. No, it's just, it's not kind of salesy. It, it's, you are absolutely fulfilling a problem people have. And every step along the way, it, it hits the, the need, you know? It's really cleverly done and it's really useful. And what would be interesting for a, anyone listening and you'd probably appreciate as an actor is if you were to sit in on it again, it is exactly the same, right? Same jo jokes at the same point, same this, same that. It is identical, right? I've got a few dot points on, on slides that remind me where I'm at in the journey. Mm -hmm. um, I remember going and seeing the Book of Mormon uh, mm -hmm. in London for its opening uh, sort of deal like the, the Broadway show and Dan and I went and just peeling ourselves in laughter of course I mean we love that kind of stuff I've been fans of South Park for a long time um, and then I don't know when it was four years later or so it came to Australia and I went with a girlfriend of mine and it was identical and I was peeling myself in laughter in exactly the same way because I'd forgotten enough of it etc but like identical because i was thinking ah oh, broadway versus like melbourne you know it's not going to be the same the quality actor but like the tonality the style the energy of the lead actors like they were totally different people but the same like this character yeah. was being re-emulated by by what felt to be the same energetic character and i was like wow and that kind of you know, when people think about how to scale a service business, how to scale something intangible, well, you know, you could argue that, you know, a show, a Broadway show is intangible, right? Because it's it's the, this spirit of communication and energy that's created on stage, but behind the scenes, there are rigid architectures and scripts and frameworks and timings and cadences and, you know, mm. the nuances of giving the audience tension and release and all the way through this narrative that does not get messed with. Mm. Um, and I don't like Bible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a big book, you know, and, and like cats or Les Mis or whatever it might be and neighbors and home and away, they've all got the Bible and it's this big book, which says what happened 20 years ago in that, character's life and who they're married to and and in those things it's um you know what they wear and what they're doing at this particular point so it's completely as you said constructed but sorry i, I interrupted well no i was just saying because i think one of the issues that i i used to have again before i learned my lessons is i'd i'd get bored of my own voice so yes. i changed that so true <laughs> right it's so true but it's like could you imagine going to a broadway show and the actors just get bored and change stuff right like nothing and they get bored Nothing more frustrating going to a concert and you can tell the musicians have just got bored singing the song in the same way. So they change it all. Like they hit songs and they change the cadence and the tone. And or they go worse, off and they don't even quiet. sing the favourite songs. You know, right. it's like going to see Queen or whatever and they don't sing Fat Bottom Girls or whatever. But yeah. as actors, they totally get bored. And I've done stage shows for, for months and you get bored as and you make your own little jokes with each other, you know, on the on the set or whatever. But it's the same with business. And this is why, you know, you've got the, the right angle, which is you've got your key points, but within that you have a little bit of flourish. But also people have not seen that before. For them, it's your their opening night. And I get bored with my own stuff too. And I think I've got to change this up. No, you don't. Oh. But I'm attracted to the shiny and the new. And therefore I actually mess with it sometimes. You know, it's completely fine the way it is. But I've yes. got bored with it. So I think for business owners... Just know that you can do the same thing many times and don't feel the need to change it up all the time. And it's a, it's a, it's a cost and a time that you don't need to invest. Something that kind of occurred to me is that um, innovation, which is change, is very expensive, um, whereas profit is very boring. 
So if you <laughs> if you nice. think of Apple, if you think of Apple developing their first iPhone or iPod or or whatever, huge expense goes into the innovation of a giant breakthrough like that. But realistically, the iPhone hasn't changed since it had a touchscreen, right? It's it's more powerful in every way, but there's been no fundamental radical breakthrough of innovation. It's been subtle tweaks along the path. And, and so they had one major change in terms of the innovation, and then they just crank the handle and make sales over and 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 over again to become you know the most valuable company in the world. And I think you know what I realized is that as part of my role as a leader is messaging, is communication, and is realizing that for messaging to work, there's a degree of repetition that needs to be involved. I need to be putting out the same message consistently. And it, and that's where the profit comes from. If I'm constantly changing the message, there's never anything for anyone to kind of get used to or, or get accustomed to. The other person I got this from was Tony Robbins, right? Where I went to his Unleash the Power Within concert, <laughs> rave, yeah. festival yeah. type thing back when I was 21 did it again five years ago very similar right Same like he's stories. innovated he's got super soakers and and some some new things now but you know the fundamental architecture and the way they promote it more importantly hasn't changed yeah interesting, find, it, interesting. find what works and then just crank the handle yeah and it's, it comes back to the content that you're talking about too like we can put a lot of content out there but we forget why we're doing it. So at some point, you, you, you've got to maybe get on the phone to those people. You know, you, you get a lead or something and there's a bit of a fear about, oh, I can't connect with my, my customer, you know. Uh, it's like just pick up the phone or have that moment to ask for the sale because people hide behind their content sometimes. They just keep pumping it out without really ever thinking, why am I doing this? What do I want? You know, um, so I think it's about bringing it back into just have that sale at the end of the the um the objective uh, next step right well, what's the next yeah. step i'd like the person to take whether it's going off and getting some content some more content whether it's getting uh, inviting them to a bigger piece of content whether that's saying hey do you need any help let's have a conversation type thing like mm. just mm. just having that that next step um how many because you're also a professional speaker right speaker mm-hmm. mc commentator etc um how many how many audiences had you presented in front of before your TED talk? Um, well, that was I think it was twenty fifteen uh, TED. I can't remember, but I I remember my first professional speaking engagement. I was my baby was just little, so it was probably fourteen years, I guess. I've been doing it before TED, and I've been a corporate trainer for a long time. You know, when I was acting. I was using corporate training as my gig, you know, my sort of paid gig. So I was working as a trainer um, and I have been since I was basically 23. And in fact, I was a lecturer at 23 at um, university. So I've sort of been performing, if you like, since in my early 20s. And I never saw it as speaking. I was lecturing or I was training. And then I sort of discovered this sort of keynote thing. And it's like it's a slightly different energy and a different sort of structure to it. Um, more entertaining, less teaching. That took me a long time to actually work out the difference as well. I think I was training for a lot of my keynotes and then I realised, no, people just want to be entertained. They want a couple of stories, you know, theme coming through strongly, but they're not wanting to be trained. So that was a big distinction for me. And was there a, was there a, did you feel different speaking at TED than you felt speaking on other platforms? Because TED tends to have a, uh, a, a vibe around it. I mean, it's an incredibly strong Definitely. brand and for a lot of people is like a pinnacle of something that they would like to achieve. Was that, uh, I mean, did that, was that in your experience of reality or was it just an, another gig? Uh, no, it was, I was terrified um, without a doubt. And I, I had never really had this, I want to be a TED talker, but it just sort of happened and, and I was very, pleased to get that role and I took it really seriously I knew this was you know you get your 12 minutes or whatever and it it's locked in in, perpe- in perpetuity <laughs> I shouldn't say that word for a long time and um and I thought I'm gonna try and nail this you know give it and I this is where the rehearsal and the acting has always been very useful because 
I treat things very seriously about when I'm, you know, speaking and training. I, I try not to wing it. And I also know I want to enjoy it. And if I rehearse it and prepare it and do all those things beforehand, I can get on stage and I can just in, enjoy is probably not the right word, but not be so scared as I might normally be. So I find through rehearsal and prep, it eliminates a lot of the fear. And I think if this is my job, I don't want to be fearful all the time. I actually want to enjoy it. So for me, it's like learn your lines, do the background. Same with acting. If you turn up on set and you don't know your lines, it's unbelievably stressful because you are holding up the entire works and one wrong fluff of the line everything has to be reset and it's literally a hundred thousand dollars plus gone so there's no room for there's no tolerance for errors in in the theater let alone the theater like that's film but on on, on a stage it is so observable there's no second take so anyway i've got that kind of in me and that's not to say i I'm perfect every time I do it, uh, far from it, but I've just realised that that helps me, you know, um, enjoy it more rather than just be terrified of it. So for Ted, for me, it was a really good experience. I, I learnt my lines off by heart and, and I knew it was a script and needs to be a script and I don't want to be fumbling. You know, you've got 12 minutes, you can't afford to fumble because if you fumble, you've just cost yourself two minutes in finding your way back into it again. So, yeah, I took it quite seriously. And yet the, the, of course, the, the irony is the, the name of the talk is Bumble Your Way to Success, right? So um, talk, talk, I'd love, by the way, I, I just realised, do you have time? Because I know we took a bit. Uh, I have, bit I've got ahead. another 20 minutes, 25 okay, minutes. Great. Beautiful. I'd love to take that if I can. Yeah. Um, uh, talk to me, talk to us a bit about this idea of, bumbling your way to success and, and maybe let me set up what why I, I i guess would love to have this conversation is um i i know for myself um very much having a a, a degree of perfectionism in me and a degree of wanting to be successful and wanting to be right and um not wanting to make mistakes and frankly not wanting to fail um, and uh, I have worked hard to soften and eliminate all of those things uh, over time to the point now where the team, we have a culture of let's go out and make some mistakes. Um, there are some lines. We don't want those mistakes to you know, really have a negative impact on any clients or anything like that, but, but trying to create a culture in my team because I realised how big of effect it had on me. And I'm like, shit, if my whole team feels that way, we're not going to do anything cool, right? But um, that the phrase of bumble your way to success, uh, could you unpack it a bit? Oh, thanks. Thanks for asking, Glenn. I, I'm quite passionate about this topic and I had to really think hard about, do I want to brand myself globally as a bumbler? You know, is that really the way I want to be seen? But I really thought it through and I do because I feel so strongly. Um it's a creative process, you know, it's, it, you can't bumble forever, by the way, I do want to establish that. But the, the way the idea came to me, it was kind of one of those little moments, I was in a workshop, like a PR workshop, half day. And I had just written my first book, Secrets of Online Entrepreneurs. And I'd written it, it was finished. And I had it there, and the whole point of the workshop was for me to learn how to market this book. And we we're going around the room, you know, you just sort of do your little three minute introduction. And, and I said, I'm here because I want to learn how to market this book. And then someone said, what's your strategy for monetizing it? And I went, I don't have one. <laughs> um, I'm basically just bumbling. And I thought for a second, am I going to say that in this room of people and honestly own that I'm a bumbler in this moment? I thought, what the heck? I don't know anyone here, whatever. So I said it. And it caused this incredible shift in the energy of that room. There's probably 10 people there. And I said, I know I shouldn't say that because I should be all over how this is going to be monetized, but I actually don't. And I'm just bumbling my way through. And people were like, oh, my God, I'm bumbling too. And we got this whole conversation completely separate to the PR. And all these professional people who were there to market their thing, they said, look, I call it, you know, um, different names, bumbling. It's like negotiating uncertainty or dealing with complexity. And we all had these kind of fancy names it's for what... Writing. Yeah, pivoting, you know, and it was a fantastic conversation because I realised I'm not alone. 
I just named it that because that's how I felt at the time and I had nothing to lose. And after that workshop, I rang Ted, um, John Yo, you know, from Ted. Yeah. And I didn't know John that well, but I thought, no, I'm going to pitch this to John. I reckon it could be an idea. And I had two ideas and I pitched the, the both and he went, not that first one, but that one about bumbling. I quite like that. I thought, oh, okay. So anyway, it went from there. And I had to, again, think about what, what is it at the heart of bumbling that is powerful? And for me, it's the beginning of every project. It's any kind of creative endeavor. It'd be learning an instrument, learning a language, a relationship, a business, writing a book, a piece of content. There's a moment where it's, it's incredibly bumbly and it's confronting because you don't know what you're doing and it's really uncomfortable when you feel it's your fault and you feel like you should know better and you should be doing this quicker. And there's all these kinds of flares that come up that are really unpleasant to experience. And when I've pushed through that and given that name of that moment, bumbling, and it's a creative process, it alleviates the need for me to correct it. And it alleviates me feeling bad about myself. I can go, it's part of the process. And I accept it. And I know it will get better. Because the consequences of not enabling that bumbling to happen is you stop and you go, I'm not doing this. This is too hard. You know, I'm not meant to be a writer. I'm not meant to be an actor. I'm not meant to be in this relationship because it's not working. And then you go, just give it a bit of time, push through the uncomfortability, let it be bad before it's good, and you'll get through to the next level. And even to this day, I still use this, I'm bumbling because I'm writing a book at the moment and it's, it's tricky, you know, it's like, mm, I'm not quite sure how this is going. I said, don't worry, push through, it's bumbling. And then you get to the next level. So for me, it's a process. And, and I was heartened after my TED talk, a guy came up to me afterwards and he said, I, you know, I enjoyed your talk. And I said, he said, I'm a bumbler. And I said, oh, what do you do? And he goes, I'm a surgeon. So I, oh, how does that work? He goes, well, when I'm suturing, we need to try new techniques, you know, and I don't tell the patient or anyone, or my nurses, whatever, but I'm bumbling because I've never used this technique before. I thought, wow, how honest is that? You know, a surgeon who, who says he's bumbling. And like without bumbling, there's no innovation. You can't have consistent knowing if you're not, you know, trying something new. Have you ever had to deal with a heckler in the sense of either online or in an event or, or just getting any negative blowback from something you've put out there into the world? Because I think that's a, I think there's a thing that people are a bit like, shit, what, what if it goes wrong? What if I, especially where I find people don't seem to care so much about an audience, but their industry peers. Yeah. Um, you know, have you ever had any blowback? Have you ever had a he heckler? Yeah. Um, I, I have. There was one incident in Perth, actually. It was a speech I've been given many times. It was like a road show and it worked fine every time everywhere else. And this woman at the end of it, it was like a 45 minute, it was a really innocuous topic. It was probably copywriting or, you know, whatever. And she, she got up and she said, I thought you were really slick. What's that? Oh, yeah, in front of everyone. Yeah, yeah, and she had yeah. this really lovely smile on her face like she was about to say something really nice. And she goes, yeah. I just thought I'd just share with you, I thought you were very slick. And it was like this real negative kind of in, intonation. of. And I went, yeah. and I was really shocked because slick is not the most complimentary word. And it's not something I no. perceive myself to be. Yeah, slick anyway. is a few steps short of slimy kind of thing. <laughs> Thank you for eliminating that, uh, for illuminating that for me. Yeah. Anyway, it was in front of like 50, 60 people and it was a breakfast and it was all gone so well. And I was really shocked in this, in front of everybody. And I, and you could hear the audience go, <gasps> you know, you could hear this sort of um, shock in the audience about this sort of very strong moment. And I had to, and you know, your first thought is to say, how dare you, you know, that's what I was saying earlier about the flaring of your defences oh, come up. Flight. Yeah. And I thought I just had to breathe for a second and go, oh, okay. And I said, excuse me, what well, I just called my therapist, you know, and I had made a bit of a joke about it mm. uh, and it kind of diffused the tension and I had to deal with it because I thought, well, what is it here? You know, I said, what is it that you're seeing, you know, that looks slick to you? And she said a few things and I went, okay, and that's that, bother you you know what what is it about that that's upsetting you so we had this whole kind of little therapy moment and as it turned out the audience could see quite clearly it became her issue not mine yeah you know she yeah. started to own it go well I guess what I see is blah 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 blah. so it was a very unpleasant moment I've got to say but 
And I and at the end, people said, "What was that all about?" So I don't know. <laughs> but I do I do want to say that if you're going to put yourself out in the public realm, you're going to get that, and you have to be prepared for it. And the way I deal with it is to say that was really unpleasant in that moment. But I have this 10, 10, 10 approach. And I got this from Jack Welch, right? Or his wife, one of the two. And it was like, okay, in these 10 minutes, that's really unpleasant feeling. Just acknowledge it's going to hurt. And just live, it, live with it. Will it matter in 10 hours? Probably not. Will it matter in 10 days? Almost certainly not. 10 years? 10 months, whatever. So I kind of compartmentalise these moments where I go, this really hurts, this is bad. And then I think, just feel it. And then I know, but it, it won't last forever. And so I really use those 10, 10, 10 moments to deal with anything that bad has happened. One of the things that I've, because I, it always freaks me out, like what, what would I say, right? Because there's an infinite amount of possibilities and there's an infinite amount of responses and what have you. And what I've found, and I'm not sure I've ever had a heckler, but we get some people often throwing out tough questions, right? Like because we're often, you know, promoting a, a product or a service and it's woven through content, et cetera, we'll get someone trying to, and it's again, usually their issue where they're, they're trying to be, basically they're trying to um, have us justify that we're not spammers or or con artists or f full of shit or whatever. And to be fair, it, it hasn't happened in many, many years. So potentially we've evolved beyond that. But back in the day when Dan and I were young, pimply, you know, 28, 29-year-olds, we used to get it a little bit more, I think, simply because of our age. Mm. And what I found is, any time anything went squirrely where someone asked a hard question and all of a sudden like they had the attention of everybody in the room and it was like, what's he going to say, et cetera. I find every time I defaulted back to starting with, like I'd take a breath, like you said, and start with our why, right? like do the Simon Sinek thing, but come back to the vision, the purpose, the why, and just be like, whatever they said, repeat it back to them and then ground in the vision, the purpose, the mission of what we're here to do at its centre and everything else is an emanation of that. There's no script for it, but that recentering around mission and purpose. And I've had some friends that have used it in the media when the media have thrown squirrely questions at them and they just default back because it's like the why is your most defensible position. Because no one can argue with that, right? That's there's right. no commercialism. So long as there's no commercialism in it, right? So long mm. as it's pure, it can't be argued with and it, it allows a almost a tactical retreat before uh, almost but while buying you time to think, it allows you to buy time, but where you are responding from is a much more powerful space. Mm. And I've found that to never fail. And it allows me to relax going into any situation going, I've always got my why, right? That's yeah. why I'm here. That's why I'm doing it. That's my fallback position. Yeah. If, I, if I forget my lines or if I go off track, it's yeah. like, how do I come back? Well, my segue is let's just recalibrate with the why. Yeah. You can't, yeah, sure. you can't go wrong. It's yours. No one can claim it's not, you know, that's your truth. It's your anchor. And I think that's what can happen when there's a conflict with anybody in what the way I try and treat it is to go, well, where, where's that commonality here? What are we trying to do here? What, you know, we might have conflict here, but under here there's, we started somewhere having common ground. And I could try and go back to that. So look, my understanding is we're trying to do this. Is that right? Are we on the same page here? Yep. And then we try to do this and we sort of work upwards to work out where the conflict happened. But if you just go back to what have we got in common here? What, what have we, what are we both trying to achieve? And, and I think that's a nice way to, deal with conflict and it just takes the the tension out of the air as well is to not eat into those because that's the temptation of the human isn't it to bite back and you know um snip it at each other and it's that defense but if you just go back to whew, the why yeah it's good um i want to i want to ask you a question about optimizing your journey right so if you were to go back and look at your um, your career and your journey of expanding as the, the author, the speaker, the entrepreneur, the multi best-selling author, TED speaker, all that sort of stuff, and, and kind of look at that journey. Um, not to say that you would ever have any regrets, but if you had the ability 
to go back to some certain points and provide yourself with some advice that might accelerate the journey, might relieve some suffering on the journey. Um, that would just generally lead to better outcomes, not that you would need to change anything, but, but where would you go back to in your journey? Like where would you go back to in a point and why there, right? The mm. old, what was that context? And, and what advice would you whisper in your ear? I think I might not be in such a rush to move from job to job. You know, I, 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 I jumped around a little bit, you know, in, in the early days in my twenties and, um, and I, I, I forgot how young I was. And I say this to people I mentor, like young people that I do mentor. And they're like, oh, they're like the week of the triple M, right? Or MTV and quite cool jobs. And, but they want to get to this next thing. And I say, you know what? That is a very strong brand that you're working for. And it's really got a lot of kudos attached to it. Use that moment where you're working in that environment to get you to your next point. And don't be too quick to lose what that's giving you because they're going, well, I'm not challenged and I don't like my boss and, you know, I want to be over there. And so I guess the, the answer I'd give to that is I would probably have stuck around. I, I don't think I really would though in advertising, even though I enjoyed it, but what I found with advertising was it got really repetitive. It's like, okay, campaign done, tick, next campaign, same process, tick. It's just a different client or it's a different product. So I got really a bit jaded with, the sameness of it, even though the creativity is different, the, the process was the same. And I have got very little tolerance for routine, as I mentioned earlier. So, and that's not a good thing. You know, I, I don't take, take that as a compliment to myself. I need to sometimes withstand boredom and, and just do the do in order to be a bit more strategic. And I, I, I want not very strategic in my career. I've got to be honest. I never had a grand plan. And again, I don't say that with how good am I or that's a, that's a shame. I, it just didn't happen that way. I guess I always followed my instinct. It's like, what's intriguing me now? What do I want to move towards? And it's funny, I look at Ruth Ostro, you know, the journalist, you know, Ruth? She's know sort of, Ruth, was yeah. a, she was a, a, the Australian columnist many, many years ago and she was quite glamorous and, and she was a bit provocative and she talked about sex and all that kind of stuff, but she was very corporate at the same time. And I must have been, I reckon, probably 20. And I remember she wrote this book about something to do with wealth or business, and she interviewed a lot of business people. And I remember thinking, what a cool job. You know, she gets to sit with these really interesting people and writes their stories. And, and she also delves into spirituality and stuff. So anyway, here I am, probably 30 years later, kind of doing what she did. You know, and so I really hold her as I'm, I must write to her. I must, I don't know her, but I'm going to get in touch with her to let her know she inspired me because uh, that's why I don't regret what, I, what I'm doing or what I did because it is, what, it is what it is and I'm here now. But if I was to tell anybody younger than me, you know, in their 20s, I say, if you're working for a big brand, big company, they've got lots of internal training opportunities, you leverage that, that kudos because once you go to say your own business, you're nobody, right? You, you can't leverage. Like when I went for Harry M. Miller, oh, my God, the invitations and the kudos and the this and that, simply by working for a very well-known person. And even the advertising agency, you get lots of things. So use those opportunities while you're young to, to get you to the next point. Last question. Um, if I could give you a token uh, and that token would allow you to write a book that would become the most celebrated book of the decade. Um, it would sell hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of copies. I'm talking international phenomenon. J.K. Rowling style. J.K. Rowling would make the, the media furor around COVID pale in comparison. Right, they, this I'm, I'm talking. I'm talking a 12-month news cycle on on this book of yours, right? And people would read it and take it seriously, and they would do what you say. As a result of the book, like that kind of a book. If I had a token with all that in it, what would you write about? Well, when you first mentioned this token, I went to a fiction book, right? Because I got a, a fiction novel on the back boiler. Um, but then at the end, you said that you'd help people um, do something with it. 
In fact, now I think about it, the novel would do that. Yeah, so I, I have a novel that um, I've written. It's 100,000 words. It's not in good shape at the moment. It needs tonnes of work. But it, that would be the book I would write. And I guess the essence of that book is it's about love and it's about relationships and about be yourself and don't try and manufacture yourself to be something you're not. Um, so I guess just two steps back, when I was younger and I was you know, looking for relationships and what have you, and I got married quite late, I got married at 41, um, I was always trying to, I think, try to be something that I really wasn't because I thought that's what was needed. And I remember being in a relationship with a man and he was quite well off and I didn't have a lot of money growing up. I sort of, you know, I came from very, you know, humble beginnings with um, but a lot of love and all that kind of stuff. There's still not tons of money throwing around. And he was quite wealthy and, and I liked him. I don't think I loved him, but I liked him, but I didn't know the difference at the time. And we were about to buy a property together and it was very luxurious and, and I could have, you know, sort of lady of leisure I, I could have been. And I was only, you know, in my sort of late 20s. And I had this sort of getting to looking at places and stuff. And and I'm we're about to buy this thing. And I'm visualizing packing up my boxes in my unit where I was living. And, you know, I'm getting the tape out and my bathroom, kitchen, and, you know, and, and nominating where things go. And I sort of looked at the feeling I was having within myself. And I thought that I'm not excited about that. And it's, I'm not excited because no matter where I go, I'm going to bring me and I'm going to be with this man in this very lovely property, but I'm not going to be happy being there. So I had to work out who do I love and why do I love them? And then I called it the, the island test. You know, if you can be on an island with this one person with nothing but a tree for shade and that's it, would this be the man? It's like, no. And I had to be really honest with myself that even though I loved a lot of what we had, it wasn't enough. I could, you know, the island test or the tin shed test is that if that's all you've got, could you live with this person? So anyway, we broke up and it was a good thing to do. So that's what my book is about is what is love and who do you have to be to find it? And what do you have to give away potentially to find it as well? Words to live by, it sounds like to me. Bernadette Schwert, thank you. How can people show their love and appreciation and how can they engage with you, with your books, with your podcast, with your, with your world? Where, where would you recommend people go? Okay. Well, uh, I guess the best way is just to go to either bernadetteschwert.com.au and find me there or copyschool.com or email me at info at copyschool.com. Uh, link, link in with me, probably another way. Uh, so books are based, Booktopia, wherever, my podcasts are on Apple. I've got two podcasts. One is How to Build an Online Business with Triple M or Listener, as they're now called. And uh, so you want to be a copywriter, and they're both on Apple as well. So I well, invite any opportunity to connect with people. I just want to say thank you for bringing your truth, um, not just in this session, but um, we are hawks when it comes to uh, dialing in and fine tuning the uh the delivery and the quality of the work that we do inside den and you know the people that we're bringing to our community and we just get gushes of uh feedback in the most glowing sense and you know i'm talking about people that didn't come to gush they, they came to get very practical outcomes to drive the growth of their business and it's just wonderful working with someone of your caliber that so effortlessly and with such grace and elegance just blows people's minds like little emoji cons with that nuclear bomb coming out of its head type thing that's just what you seem to to bring um as i said with such grace and elegance and so i want to thank you and and compliment you and acknowledge for that and just share my my gratitude for the work that you do and the magic that you bring to the Dent world and the Dent community. So thank you. Thank you, Glenn. It's a pleasure. I really appreciate that. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're tuning in, there's only three things you've got to do at this point, and that's uh, be brave, have fun. Let's go make a dent in the universe. <laughs>